You know, I found that uh, the greatest enemy, I used to think the greatest enemy in the Christian life were other people, you know, and having to deal with uh, that sort of thing. But I, I've soon found out that the greatest enemy in the Christian life is me. I am my greatest enemy. And we're going to see that tonight here as we look at David. 1 Samuel chapter 20, if you'd go there, please. On Sunday evenings, we've been going through the life of David. And uh, what we need in our lives more than anything else is the Word of God. Amen. The Bible is what changes us. Amen. It's not the singing. It's not any of that stuff, although those are good things. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's how we are molded and shaped into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, is through his word. And we learn so much from David, and we are just in the beginning stages of, of the record of his life here in the Bible. We have a long way to go. But we've come to 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. So let's stand together if you're able to stand. Let's read responsively. I'll begin in verse 1. And we'll read down to verse 10. If you're able to stand, if not, stay seated. That's fine. Uh, and we'll read together. First Samuel. It's funny. I'm looking at my sermon here. And as I wrote it, I put Second Samuel there. So I'm, I'm already confused myself. First Samuel, yes, is correct. Notice verse 1. And David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and, and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? And he said unto him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And David sware moreover, and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at even. If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asks leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee, notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself, for why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? And Jonathan said, Far be it from thee, for if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee, then would not I tell it thee? Then said David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? Now we're going to stop there tonight. We could go on and talk about this story. We'll deal with the arrows later. You remember the whole arrow thing, which was a signal to David of whether to go or whether to stay. But uh, instead of dealing with that whole thing tonight, I just want to deal with this first part because I, see, I think we find something happening in the heart and life of David. It happens in our heart and life quite often. What is it? Well, let's find out. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing upon the message. I need thee this evening. Lord, I need you to enable me. I recognize that without you, I can do nothing. Amen. Lord, we can do nothing. We can't hear right without you. We can't understand without you. So please help us this evening as we look at this portion of this story in the life of David. Please help us to take from it the things you want us to take from it. May we understand thy truth, but may we not just understand it. May it affect our lives, that we would be able to see things in our own lives as this story relates to us. Again, please rebuke and bind the devil. Fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit. And may your word this evening have free course. And we'll ask these things and give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It was only four chapters ago, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, 
that God's prophet Samuel was sent by God to go to this house of a man named Jesse. He lived in a little town of Bethlehem, about six miles south of Jerusalem, to anoint Jesse's eighth son, David, to be Israel's next king, just four chapters ago. David's anointing was the result of King Saul's unrepentant, self-willed, sinful behavior. And so God is now going to remove Saul from being king, and he's now going to bring David in as his choice for Israel's second king. Amen. Saul's out, David is in. Now, even though David was anointed king, it would be about 10 years. 10 years before he would be publicly anointed over the entire nation of Israel. This is an event recorded for us in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 3. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. After all that time went by, finally, finally, David's third, if you will, anointing to be the king, the recognized king over the nation of Israel. What's happening between this time? You know if you've been here on Sunday nights. God was using this time from that day that uh, Samuel came to his house uh, till that day in 2 Samuel 5 uh, to prepare David to be king, to remove Saul from being king, and to prepare the nation of Israel to receive David. You know, this period in David's life could be called the school of preparation. God preparing him. Understand something very important as I take a sidestep here. David's path to the throne was not easy. Amen. Oh, yes, he was called. You'd think, well, I'm called of God, so it's going to be easy to get to the throne. <laughs> not so. It was no velvet-covered road, if you will. And by the way, it never is. When God calls you or me to do something, understand uh, it's not going to be easy. Right. It's going to be rough. rough. David's road was extremely rugged, filled with many bumpy trials and troubles. And may I declare, this is God's way. Amen. You say, I don't like that. I agree. I don't either. But it's what's best for us. And so often we do everything in our power to avoid the bumps and to uh, uh, get as quickly as possible to the throne. And we forget that all that happened to David was designed by God to prepare him, to make David a better person, to, to make David a better king when he got to the throne. That's why the struggles, you say, I don't want them. Well, it's part of the journey. You know, we forget that uh, this is what God's design was for David. You know, rough trials provide much opportunity for creating strong character. Amen. Preparing us for what God has. Do not, dif uh, do not view the difficult times of life as only negative experiences, uh, for they may very well be some of the most profitable experiences of your life, Amen. even though we don't like going through them. David is going to go and has gone through test after test after test after test. And by the way, so far he's done well. Hasn't he? Amen. Since his anointing, what has he faced? Well, he faced a nine-plus-foot giant there by the name of Goliath uh, facing off with him. He did pretty good, if you ask me. He faced uh, false ass accusations and criticism of his brethren along the way, and he did well, if you ask me. He had to deal with a promotion as a young man uh, to a place in Saul's army. He had to deal with the adoration of the crowds. Uh, he had to deal with the jealousy of King Saul. Uh, he had to deal with the unjust demotion of King Saul, and he did well through all of that. 
He's fought battle after battle after battle against the Philistines. He has been deceived by Saul. He has been hated by Saul. And now he's being pursued by Saul for no reason. And David has done a tremendously remarkable job responding in a godly way to everything thrown at him. Over and over we read, particularly in chapter 18, uh, how David behaved himself wisely. Look at verse 5 of chapter 18. And David went out, whithersoever Saul sent him, notice, and behaved himself wisely. Amen. Look down at verse 14. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. And the Lord was with him. Look at verse 15. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. Then look at verse 30 of chapter 18. Uh, then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. Again and again, every trial, every tribulation, every difficulty, every pressure that he faces, David does well. Amen. Until now. Until now. Until chapter 20. You know, as we read through this, or as we read through this, we're seeing a side of David that we haven't seen before. We're hearing words from the mouth of David that weren't like David. Something's happening in David's life. Up to this point, all we've seen, chapter after chapter, trial after trial, is David as a strong, courageous, fearless, faithful, fighting young man. Amen. But we don't see that here. Now we see a young man that's overcome with fear. And now we see a young man who, I'll put it this way, is wavering in his faith in God. We see it. Amen. So I don't see it. We'll see it here in a moment. Tonight I want to preach on this subject. We've seen in this series so far the searching for a king. The preparing of a king. The receiving of the king. The testing of the king. The training of the king. The snaring of the king. Last week, the protecting of the king. Tonight I want to preach on this subject. The wavering of a king. You'd think David would have it down after all these trials. He'd just continue to move forward in his Christian life. But he stumbled. May I say this, if any of us think that we're so strong that we can never waver in our faith, we're wrong. Amen. You know, it's easy for me to get on my high horse. I like it up there. Makes me look good. When things are going well in my life and I feel strong, I can look down my spiritual nose and say, come on, man, you know, faith it out, will you? But then something happens to me. And the pressures get to me. And I realize something. I'm not as strong as I think I am. We all waver at times. Well, not me, preacher. Well, you just wait then. You just wait. Given, given the right circumstances and enough pressure in your life, every one of us has a potential to waver. You know, the Bible warns us about this. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Amen. It says, watch out. Do you think you're strong and you think you're standing uh, and you got it all together? Be careful. Right. Be very careful. Proverbs 16, 18 puts it this way. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. God has an amazing way of humbling us. Amen. And the circumstances of life show us really many times that we're nearly not what we think we are. We are. You know, I think of Peter. That, this warning is illustrated in Peter. Do you remember Peter in Matthew chapter 26 where he says to the Lord, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended 
That's like looking in the mirror, isn't it? When things are going well in our lives. When everything's smooth, when the trials are taken care of, when the pressures, the pressures we can handle. That's what we say. We say, oh no, not me. I will never be offended. And Jesus says to him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, that thou shalt deny me thrice. Perhaps that prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ for Peter is a prayer that should apply to all of us where he said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Amen. Don't think because you've been strong in the past or you're strong today that you're going to be strong in the future. Amen. Your faith may waver. Amen. So the question is, how can we tell if our faith is wavering? Are there signs? Are there things that we find, characteristics in our life? I don't think David knew, I don't think he knew his faith was wavering. By that, I don't think he said, stood up and said, you know what, I'm just going to waver in my faith today. I think it just happened, just like it does with us. But how can we tell? What do we see in David's life that give evidence that he is wavering? And by the way, it will be the same things in your life and my life that will show something's wrong in our hearts. Hard to admit sometimes, but it's true. Notice as we look at verse 1, I want you to notice the first revelation, if you will, the revealing of David's wavering faith was this. Number one, his departure from Rama. His departure from Rama. You say, what is that? Well, let's read it. And David fled from Naoth in Rama. Mark it down. Underline it. He fled and came and said before Jonathan. You remember in chapter 19, David had just experienced the, the miraculous protection of God. Do you remember last week what happened? God protected him in an amazing way, time after time after time. God protected him when Saul threw that javelin at him, using Jonathan to warn him in chapter 19 and verse 10. He protected David when his servants went to his house uh, to kill him. You remember that? Using Michael to hide him or to pretend he was there and send him away, warning him to go. Do you remember that? That was God protecting him. And then Saul and his servants uh, chased David. David fled from his house uh, where Michael was, and he went down to Ramah. He spoke to Samuel. He went with the man of God, uh, and Saul and his servants went after them. And do you remember that God confounded them in some sort of spiritual spell, if you will, Amen. and protected him? And that's how the chapter ends. And when chapter 20 begins, notice what we read. David, who is in the right place, he is in the hometown of Samuel. He is with the right person. He is with Samuel, the man who God has ordained to be the prophet and the counselor in Israel. What does he do? He flees from that place. He runs. He goes somewhere else. David departed from the very place that he should have stayed. Yeah. Do you know that this is what wavering faith does? We run. We run from the place, the very place, where we should stay. What do we do when our faith wavers and the pressure gets big, if you will, in our lives? What do we do? We tend to flee to the wrong people and we flee to the wrong place. What's one of the first things that happens in a Christian's life when they face trouble and their faith begins to waver? I'll tell you what it is. They start missing church. I understand some people miss because of health and other things. That's what I'm talking about here tonight. I'm talking about when the faith begins to waver, what you find is they start missing church. They, they flee from the very place that they should be fleeing to. Amen. They run from the very place that they should be running to. Amen. It's our human nature. Amen. That's why I take note of people when they miss. That's why our staff and our deacons take note when people... What, what, are you, what are you, like the KGB or something? Is that what you are, the spiritual KGB? No. Because we understand this principle. Amen. 
We understand when someone is struggling. We understand when someone is going through something, when they're feeling the pressures of life. Often they think, I, gotta, I, I can't go to church. It's kind of odd thinking, isn't it? Amen. And that person that's typically here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night in Sunday school, all of a sudden, you don't see them on Wednesday evening. And you say, hmm, wonder where they are. Then they start missing Sunday evening. And you say, hmm, where are they? And then you find they start gradually dropping out of serving and out of ministries. Uh, that's what they do. Uh, and then they only come sporadically uh, to Sunday school and then Sunday morning until finally they're out of church. It's a familiar pattern. A pattern of someone whose faith is wavering. Do you know that church attendance is a spiritual thermometer? Do you understand that? Amen. It is. It is. Uh, no one, no one, may I say it again emphatically, no one is a strong Christian that is not faithful to church. Amen. And when we begin to waver, that's what happens. We, we flee from the wrong place. That's right. Then the second thing is this. They seek counsel from people other than the man of God. Right. They're trying to find answers from people that they shouldn't be trying to find answers from. Now, I'm not trying to drum up business here tonight. I'm really not. But the truth of the matter is, is that God gives to every believer a pastor. He does. Uh, God's man to be in that place. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who that is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And he gave some past, I'm sorry, apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Praise the Lord. And so often what happens is when believers are waning in their faith, the, the pastor is the last person they want to see. In fact, they avoid him. They even sometimes get mad at him. And we'll talk, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. You come knocking on the door. They're not home when they are home. What is that? That's a sign of wavering faith. My friends, when our faith wavers, we flee. That's what we do. We, we, we just go. We flee church. We flee serving God. We, our zeal flees. Uh, our joy flees. Uh, and these things are evidences of a wavering faith. Amen. Can I ask you something tonight? Taking the spiritual test. Do you pass this test of is your faith wavering? Are you backing up? Are you getting out instead of getting more in? Are you easing away instead of getting stronger for the Lord? That's a sign of where you are spiritually. It really is. So we see, number one, the first evidence of David's wavering faith was his departure from Ramah. The second one I want you to notice, uh, evidence of David's wavering faith, was this, his discussion with Jonathan. David starts to say things that, that, that are unusual for David. Notice what we read in verse 1, and we could read all the way down, but notice he says in verse 1, and we're going to come back to this again, uh, he says to Jonathan, what have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? You see, David's words re to Jonathan reveal a wavering faith. Listen to what he's saying. Look at verse 3. Thy father certainly knoweth I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan uh, know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Notice verse 8, if you would, at the end of the verse. He says, If there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. For why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? Look at verse 10. Then said David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? Are you listening to his words? It's almost as, that, as if David sounds like he's hopeless. Look at verse 3 again. Uh, he says, uh, uh, he says uh, Truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. This is quite a different attitude uh, than what he had a few chapters ago when he faced Goliath. 
Well, where's God in all this? Where is the Lord in all this? Amen. Amen. What happened to David? He's saying, I'm going to die. How am I going to figure this out? He's taking everything into his own hands. What happened to the young man who said this in 1 Samuel 17, 26? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Where is that David? Amen. Where is the David that said in 1 Samuel 17, 29, is there not a cause? Amen. How about 1737? The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the uh, hands of this Philistine. Amen. Chapter 17, verse 45. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Amen. 1747. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Where is that, David? Saul and the devil in his flesh warm out. His faith is wavering. David makes no mention of God. It's God's protection, God's greatness. God's ability here in chapter 20, God's faithfulness. You know what he's done? He stopped seeing God and only saw his circumstances. And it's revealed by his words. Everything out of David's mouth is now negative. Negative. Do you know one of the most obvious signs of someone who is wavering in their faith is that they start whining and complaining and they're negative about everything. Amen. Well, that's just my personality. No, no. It's a faith problem. Amen. It's an absolute faith problem. They complain about their circumstances. Complain about their health, complain about their finances, complain about their car problems, complain about their problems at work. They complain about people. They complain how people don't call them and people don't visit them. And they complain about their family, their church. They complain about other church members. They complain about the pastor. They complain about the staff. They complain about the school. Uh, people aren't showing them enough attention. Nobody loves them. It's a faith problem. Amen. They never see the good in anything. They have hope in nothing. They don't see God in anything. They're never satisfied. Everything is, woe is me. <laughs> Can I ask you something? If, if that describes you, and by the way, if that is you, you're going to find out people don't want to be around you very often. Because my God still can. Amen. He can still do things. Uh, I remember for years when, when I first got it. Yeah, that's the field of dreams over there. That's what they call it, the field of dreams. Nothing's ever going to happen over there. What do you have to say now? God connected us. There's step number one. You know, that's, that's how we get. Well, it's not going to happen. Nothing's going to happen over there. No, no, no. You have a faith problem. My God can still do anything. He can do everything. Amen. He is still God. He's still on the throne. And no, throne, and no matter what things look like, no matter what problems that we face, understand He knows and He is in control and my God can. Amen. And He can in your life as well. You know what we sound like sometimes? The Old Testament children of Israel coming out of the wilderness. I mean, why, 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 why? Let me show you something. Go back to Exodus chapter 16. I, I, I'm amazed at what happened here in Exodus chapter 16. Now, mind you, the chapter. Look at verse 1. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came under the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. Notice, two months, fifteen days, since they stepped foot out of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel, what? 
murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For he had brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Huh. I'm glad I wasn't Moses. Man, if I were the Lord, lightning bolts everywhere. But you, but you, I'd really make more use of lightning bolts than, than God does. Than, you know, I just would. That's just what I, I would do. Think about this. What did they just see with their own eyes? What did they just live through? Every one of them. They just saw, uh, they experienced the plagues in Egypt and how God protected them. They experienced the redemption uh, out of Egyptian bondage. They experienced the parting of the Red Sea. Can you imagine that? They saw the wall of waters on each side of them. And they marched through. Uh, and as they got to the other side, they looked back. And they were so frightened because of Pharaoh and the chariots and his armies. And God closed the sea up on them. And they rejoiced in chapter 15 of how great their God was. Amen. And now they're complaining. What's the problem? Wavering faith. You know, some people are just always out of sorts. I mean, the weather is just, whatever it is, it's not what you want. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too humid. It gets dark too early. It stays light too late. Come on. I, I mean, you name it. You, you find something to complain about. Uh, reminds me of a story I told years ago. A farmer who grew, up, who grew several crops. Uh, his name was Mr. Nailing. He had a neighbor. And uh, Mr. Nailing, boy, was he a complainer. Neighbor comes to him on a rainy day. says, hello, Mr. Nailing. It's a great day, isn't it? Fine weather for your grass crops. He says, bad for the corn. The guy said, oh, okay. So a few days later, the sun's shining out again. And he says, oh, good morning, Mr. Nailing. He said, how are you doing? Boy, that sun's great for your corn, isn't it? He said, yeah, it's awful for the rye. Oh. Then it was a little cool a little later, and there's a guy afraid, you know, morning, Mr. Nailing, uh, it's a great day for the rye. He says, it's the very worst for the corn and the rye. It's the very worst for it. I mean, he just complained. You know, sometimes we get that way. And, you know, people don't want to talk to people like that. They want to be around people like that. Because we have a God that can do anything. Amen. You see, this, this is the attitude of someone whose faith is wavering. You know, if it's raining out there, you know why it's raining? It's not. I know it's not. But if it were, because God, wa God wants it to rain, and, and, and our grass and, and, and the trees and the vegetables need, need water. If it's cool out, it's because God wants it to be cool out, you know? I mean, have you ever, where is God in our lives? Amen. Listen, listen. I, I'm talking to myself here. I need to listen to how I sound. Because sometimes I sound like a hopeless, negative person. And when I do, you know what that means? That means my faith is wavering. That means I've taken God out of the equation and I'm thinking only humanly about things and about me. That's what happened to David. Saul's going to get me. He's going to kill me. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? We've got to have a plan. Oh, no, no. I can't believe this. Uh, negative, negative, negative. Not one praise of God in this thing. Not one, uh, I stand before you in the name of God and he's going to get me through that. God's going to protect me from Saul. You don't hear any of that. Because his faith is wavering. Then there's a third thing and we're done. Notice not only we see his wavering faith from, because of his departure from Rama, and then his discussion with Jonathan. And then the third thing is kind of interesting. I don't know if you picked up on this when we read it, but it's, it's there. It's not in Exodus. It's in uh, 1 Samuel uh, for chapter 20. But here's this. Watch what he does. His distrust of Jonathan. He's starting to look a little funny at Jonathan. Like Jonathan's deceiving him. That's what he's doing. You know when David first met up with Jonathan? Notice in verse 1, he fires several questions at him. What have I done? What is mine iniquity? What is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? Look at verse uh, 8. If there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. For why shouldest thou bring me uh, to thy father? 
Verse 10, then said David to John, who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? Do you know what he's doing? He's charging Jonathan with distrust. That, that's what he's doing. Can you imagine being, Jonathan had no idea. John, Jonathan was just trying to do the right thing. He and David were very close friends. Uh, do you remember they entered into that covenant one with another in 1 Samuel 19? And Jonathan swore and promised that if he knew anything, he would warn David of the plans. And David's saying this, I think you know something. And you're not telling me. Something's going on. David is implying by these questions that Jonathan has, has not been true to his word, not been true to their friendship, but this charge was unjustified. Amen. Amen. There were no grounds for it. Right. Jonathan, this time, was ignorant of his father's plans, but David stopped trusting him. He kind of had a funny look about Jonathan. You know why? Watch this. He allowed his feelings to affect him more than the facts. Amen. David's unjustified distrust of Jonathan was evidence of a wavering faith. Let me show you what I mean by that. Please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. There are people, there are people that have proven that they cannot be trusted. I'm not saying here blindly trust everyone because there are people that by the way relationships are built on trust right you break your trust you break the relationship right and in order to resume or regain that relationship trust has to rebuild and be formed I think we understand that if not I've preached on it several times get the message but then but it's true and there are people that prove that they cannot be trusted because they live a double life I understand that but that's not what I'm talking about here what I'm talking about here is this. When we get to the place that without any evidence, without any just cause to think so, that we cannot trust anyone, and that everybody has a secret life, and that everybody's a fake, and that everybody is doing wrong, understand something. The problem is not with those people. The problem's with you. Amen. With you. Your faith is wavering. You know, I've known people that have had bad experiences with pastors and churches, and, it's, and, and, and they truly have, where the pastor did wrong. I mean, name, name the sin, you know. We're sinners, right? Uh, I mean, he took money, he committed immorality, or was dishonest, whatever. But what happens often is from that experience, they refuse to trust any pastor because everybody's got something up their sleeve. Everybody's got something in their closet. You know what the problem is? Not that you don't trust that person. You don't trust God. Because if you're distrusting people without any evidence, without anything to go on, there's no cause for that. Understand something. You have a problem in your faith. Amen. It is. You, know, you don't trust me. You trust God with me. Amen? Unless you have some sort of reason not to, you know? And of course we know you don't. But anyway, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So I'm going to challenge us tonight. We're done right here. As you and I look at these, these evidences in the life of David and see that his, it's, these things show that his faith was wavering, can I ask you something? Do any of these things describe you? Do you have you dropped out of things? Are you backing up in your Christian life? Have you uh, kind of uh, started to fall away? And you say, well, we just, you know, we just don't come on Wednesday night anymore. That's a faith problem. Maybe your discussion, maybe the, what comes out of your mouth is just negative, complains, always looking at the dark side of things, the bad side of things. Uh, can I say this? You have a faith problem. Your faith is wavering tonight. Amen. And then maybe you don't trust anybody. That's a sad place to be. Whoa. It is. You know, uh, just give people the benefit of the doubt. Unless there's some reason not to trust them, just trust them. Amen. David's having some issues here. Amen. David, in a little bit, is going to flee. I think next week we're going to talk about the fleeing king. But something right here is happening in his heart. His faith is wavering. He's going away from the Lord. His trust in God is not where it should be. Can I ask you something tonight? Where is yours? Amen. Do you trust him? 
Are you strong? Do you believe God can do anything? God can take care of people. God can take care of my problems. Amen. That is evidence of a strong faith. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together.